All right, this is a big one. I am a huge Tally Hall fan, and ever since I was shown the Marvin's Marvel's Mechanical Museum album by my friend, I have slowly fallen down the rabbit hole to the point of no return. So to quell my obsession, I've decided to project it onto my YouTube channel. You've probably already seen my two covers of some Tally Hall related songs, and all of that has been leading up to this video. And in today's video, I'm going to rank nearly every song in the Tally Hall universe from worst to best, all 76. Before we begin, let me define exactly what it is I'm ranking. I'll be ranking the songs from the seven main albums in the Tally Hall universe, being Marvin's Good and Evil, Hawaii Part 2, Joe Holly Joe Holly, Not the Trampoline, Sketches 3D, and select songs from admittedly incomplete demos. I'll not be including any songs which were never properly released, such as Maybe in the Night, or some singles like Just a Friend and Light and Night, although there will be some exceptions to this. I'll also be not including most of Kojim Dip's music, because I don't really care much for their genre, and I wouldn't want to put Bora's music in F just because I don't like the genre. Also, all of these are my opinions. You are entitled to your own opinion, and you can complain all about my choices in the comments. Now with that out of the way, let's get into it. These songs are the absolute worst things to come out of Tally Hall. One probably won't surprise you, but the other one might. I know, I know, this one's obvious. If you're a Tally Hall fan, you either love Be Born or hate it. And I'm firmly on the latter. There's an entire community that stands by this song being amazing, but I just dislike it. First of all, the song is literally a father telling their growing child to, well, be born. It's a weird concept, and it's made all the weirder by it being the only country song Tally Hall has made to date. I hate country music, so I suppose I'm biased. The only good part of the song are the ba-ba-ba's and the bridge, and they are pretty good. But other than that, whenever I listen to this song, I instinctively want to- Ridiculous. You can put a box. Mary Kay. I didn't cover Kojim Dip's music in this ranking because I don't really like rock music, and it'd be unfair to put all of Burra's music in the lower tiers. This is the only song in Tally Hall's discography that can really be called rock without people making fun of you when you say it is. Also, this song is just about an obsession with the Olsen twins, which is kind of a weird concept. The songs in this tier are songs that I personally don't like, but they aren't awful. I understand if people like these songs, they just don't... I don't know, I just don't like them very much. We're both in space. Whenever I listen to Joe Holly, Joe Holly, this song always leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I love the album. It's silly and perfectly reflects Joe's not entirely stable nature. But this song just doesn't do it for me. The chorus sounds like a mess of sound, and hearing We Are In Space yelled at you during the chorus over and over again isn't very fun. The lyrics and the verses themselves are pretty fun to listen to, though. Singer, songwriter, producer, televangelist, Hot Rod Duncan. Out of all the songs in Joe Holly, Joe Holly, this one's definitely the weakest. While We Are In Space is ranked lower than this, it definitely has more substance. This song is a strange story about Ross Featherman's Tally Hall drummer, Alter Ego, Hot Rod Duncan, from an episode of the Tally Hall Internet Show. I don't know what to say about this one, it's strange. The frogs at the beginning are quite jarring, and so is the rest of the song. It's very out of place in the rest of the album. A rather strange looking lump, known as a sea cucumber. This is a demo from the 2015 album, Admittedly Incomplete Demos. It has a lot of great songs, but this one is the weakest in my opinion. It's a short demo that talks about how we're all sea cucumbers, and I don't really care for it. I can see why this song never got fully produced, but it's neat that they released it after all these years. This next song is going to be really controversial, so uh, prepare your angry comments. I'm a banana! Okay, I understand that it's a song with deep meaning or whatever, but it just isn't appealing to me. Tally Hall is known for their weirdness, but this song it just seems like it's pure nonsense. Sometimes that's alright, but the music which goes along with it isn't good either. I just don't like Banana Man. Sue me. I'm too much! Just Apathy is a fairly basic loved song, but it is definitely one of the heterophonic tunes of How Love Bites of all time. For being one of Rob's earlier works, it's not terrible. Although Rob has never been bad at songwriting, as seen in some songs in admittedly incomplete demos. It has some pretty basic lyrics and a fairly catchy chorus, but I can't really say anything specific about it. Boo! 
Ghost is the opening track on Rob's solo album, Not a Trampoline, and I gotta say that it does not do the album justice. It's an, it's a pretty simple song, just like the rest of the album, but it is excruciatingly uninteresting. The lyrics talk about how our regrets haunt us, and it's extremely repetitive. I wish the album had opened with something more interesting, because this song single-handedly made me less interested in it for an entire week. That's an invisibility cloak! Another weak album opener. Sketches 3D is a great album, but Miss Melody is definitely the weakest song. It has some good lyrics and, well, melody, but there's nothing to write home about. It's quite boring, and it's quite repetitive until the bridge. Andrew's voice has always been unreliable, and it can go from beautiful to gasping for breath in an instant, but his voice is pretty good in Miss Melody. This song's disappeal for me is purely in its lyrics and melody. This is just a fairly mediocre song by Rob, not much else to say. Team, go! We're on the go! go is another song from Into the Lee and Complete Demos that I can't say I'm disappointed that it wasn't produced. It's an alright song, but it doesn't bring anything special to the table. I could not imagine it in Good and Evil, which was the plan for it. Probably the most forgettable song off of Sketches. It sounds nice near the end, but the lyrics near the beginning aren't particularly good. His name is Andy White, guy in 1985. This is the third song I know that involves the year 1985, the other two being by Bo Burnham and Bowling for Soup. Uh, this is also the third worst song that I know that involves the year 1985, the top two being Bo and Bowling for Soup songs, respectively. It's alright, but the chorus is fairly jarring in terms of a consistent rhythm. <laughs> All of those songs are just fine. There's nothing especially bad about them, but nothing especially good either. Now, with the bad songs out of the way, we can get into the good ones. Nothing significantly fantastic about them, but still good in their own rights. Hey, who turned out the lights? I like Turn the Lights Off, but that's it. I don't think it's the brilliant song everyone online says it is. This is the worst song in Good and Evil, in my opinion, and I usually skip this one. I do like how when Tally Hart performed this one before the release of Good and Evil, the song actually ended with them saying turn the lights off and then the lights on the stage actually turn off. Eh, just a fun thing I like. When Joe Holly attacks, no one gets out alive. Am I really going to put Joe Holly attacks above turn the lights off? Yes, yes I am. Joe Holly Attacks perfectly sums up the insanity that is Joe Holly, Joe Holly, and sets the mood for how the rest of the album will be. And the fade out to the sudden opening of Black People, White People immediately after is comedy gold. Dolly bit me. I feel like I should love Cannibal. It's catchy and it features Zubin's fantastic voice. It's a pretty good song, but I just don't like it. It's not particularly interesting to me, and I don't tend to nod my head or tap my feet while listening to it. Greener is a very good song, but it's difficult to follow up Good Day. It suddenly shifts genres, which does help first time listeners understand how Tally Hall is with genres, but as I said earlier, I don't like rock. Now this song is by no means real rock, but it's rock adjacent, and that's bad enough for me. Also I feel like rock- also, I feel like Rob says miles away from home at least 10 times, and it, it gets repetitive. This song is about the death of famous MASH actor Alan Alda, and it is a heartwarming send-off to the actor after his passing. However, this song becomes quite disturbing when a quick Google search reveals that Alan Alda is still alive, and this makes us question Rob's true intentions with the actor. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! This song is brilliant. It's all about someone desperately trying to write a haiku but not being able to do so. And this shows in the song's lyrics, and that it goes from five syllables to seven syllables to six syllables, which is one off from being a haiku. Other than that, though, it's a pretty simple song and one of the weaker ones on the back half of Marvin's. <laughs> Songs in B tier are pretty good, and the fact that over three-fourths of this universe's songs are in it or above goes to show how great this band and its side projects really are. I lied about Daisy Fingers. This is the most forgettable song off of Sketches. I couldn't remember a single lyric from this song after hearing it just days earlier, although after hearing it again, I do love this song. It has some of Andrew's best lyrics and has a calming and peaceful melody, and his singing is pretty good in this one too. Wait a minute! Who are you? 
While still one of the weaker songs in Good and Evil, Who You Are has a great arrangement. The instruments used are quite unique in terms of modern day songwriting, and Tally Hall uses them perfectly. When I first heard, I genuinely thought Joe wrote it, but I can see it as a Rob song looking back. Still not one of my favorites from Good and Evil, but not bad. Everything is perfect. The music video Rob made for this is hilarious. Regardless, perfect is by no means perfect, but it is perfect in just the way it is. It's a fun song with some mildly sexist undertones, but it is really just a song about being self-confident regardless of one's faults. It's a simple song with a simple message. That's it. No red, no purple, no green, no color. This is another incomplete demo, and it's a solid one. Of course, any song sung by Zoobs is great vocally, but his voice goes along with some great lyrics. It sounds like it's either written by Joe or Andrew, but my money's on Andrew. <laughs> this song literally has six sentences in English and then flamingo for the rest of the song. It's so delightfully silly and is a real breath of fresh air when compared to the fairly straightforward songs in the remainder of the album. Rob said that it was his favorite song and not a trampoline, and I completely understand why. Guys, this is Miranda. She's one of the boys! As a They Might Be Giants fan, this song's reference to them was a nice inclusion. While Black People, White People is a fairly silly song, this song really makes the insanity of the album apparent. There's no real chorus to this song, but the calm part sounds delightful to my ears. Although, also, the song ends with a Super Mario theme, which perfectly transitions to the video game-centric song, Crazy Food. <laughs> People like to hate Out on the Twilight. Yes, it does sound a lot like the songs found on Not a Trampoline, but that's not bad. This is the last Rob written song from Tally Hall, and I like it. The chorus is fantastic in both lyrics and music, and the verses aren't bad either, although Stone and Glass is repeated a few times too many. And that outro, damn! Are you looking for a new bed? Well, you're in luck, because I have one, and I want to sell it to you. Please buy my bed. This is Joe's latest song, and the newest work released by any Tally Hall member as far as I'm aware, and it is far more insane than any song off of Joe Holly Joe Holly. I'm sure the lyrics have meaning, but it is near impossible to discern what it could be. Regardless of it, it's a great song. Its sound is all over the place and is extremely fun to listen to. I mean, Johnnying the depths of fun and girling cortex? How does Joe come up with this stuff? What does it mean? Lullaby and the night. Interesting, both of the songs with bed in the name are right next to each other. Anyway, Go to Bed is a great closer to Joe Holly Joe Holly. It actually features the band Mini Mall, which was a Tally Hall cover band at one point. Anyway, it's a really fun song, which was influenced by one of Joe's first works in the Tally Hall era, being the song Break It Down, a song he made for his comedy group Anonymous. I love the rhyming part of the song, and the fact that it just ends with Good Night Joe Holly is really funny to me. You and me, but mostly me. This song feels like the bridge from Rob's writing style for Marvin's and his writing style for his solo ventures. There are still traces of how he used to write for Marvin's, but combined with the sound of his solo work, I really like it, regardless of its length. Ironically, this and Out in the Twilight are the exact same length, and are tied for second shortest songs in the album aside from A Lady, the first being Sacred Beast. Wait, it's all Avenger. Always has been. Some consider this Andrew's finest work, but I don't think that's true. Don't get me wrong, the song is fantastic, but I think he's just done better things. I'll get to that later. The Whole World in You is the only Tally Hall song which has been confirmed to have no deeper meaning by the writer. It's simply a fun song and talks about how amazing the listener is. I don't think that's entirely true though, seeing as the music video appears to be a social commentary about elected officials. But it is certainly a fun song. Andrew's voice is great in this song, and the fact that they misspelled a word and kept it in for nearly two decades is hilarious. Also, this song was in a Crayola commercial. This song truly kickstarted Tally Hall's success. It won Andrew a scholarship, it appeared on the OC, and they even performed it on several late night shows. This is easily one of the most well-known Tally Hall songs aside from current internet culture, and definitely Andrew's most popular. I didn't know that Andrew had written this until I was researching this video, but when I re-listened to it, I could see Andrew's writing in it. This song is the perfect album opener for Tally Hall, because similarly to Joe Holly Attacks, it portrays the randomness of Tally Hall hand in hand with Greener, and the bridge has to be one of my favorite parts of Marvin. People were born to Indonesian single moms in 1957. 
This song was originally demoed for Good and Evil, and you can tell that it was either inspired by or the inspiration for And. Good and Evil is all about parallels, and this song's lyrics are nearly all parallels, at least up until the ending. This is also one of the few songs in the Tally Hall universe that swears excessively. This song's opening is extremely shocking, and there's no delay from the beginning of the song to the lyrics. And when you're shuffling through songs and it comes up, it can be a little. Just... And when you're shuffling through songs and it comes up, it can be a little bit of a jump scare. This is called Magic Sand. Hidden in the Sand was the well, hidden track on the CD and vinyl release of Marvin's, in that it was not listed on the track list. Of course, it isn't like this on the digital releases, but it's still neat. This song is short, simple, and sweet. There's a fantastic music video which closed out the Tully Hall internet show, and it is beautiful ukulele playing. It's a great song, but it's just okay. Welcome to Tally Hall. Welcome to Tally Hall is exactly what it sounds like. It perfectly welcomes any new members to Tally Hall, explaining what the band is, the members' roles in it, and how silly it can be. Along with easing the new listeners into the rabbit hole, it's an absolute jam. This song is a fun run through of what you need to know about Tally Hall, and it's a bop through the entire song. Hey, yo, mama's so big fat that she didn't was was a McDonald's Big Mac. <laughs> As stated on the Tally Hallmanac, Your Mother is a Basketball is about your mother and her similarity to a spherical sports-related object, being a basketball. This song is a delightfully fun song to listen to. I'd be lying if I said I didn't know all the lyrics to the song by heart. The song is about a sort of game where the goal is to roast one's mother's size until the ref decides it's good enough, and it goes hard. You and you, but mostly you. Some people tend to dislike you because of Andrew's vocals in it, and while they aren't as good as they could be in this song, everything else about it makes up for it. This song has one of the most beautiful piano parts I've ever heard from Tally Hall, and as soon as I listened to it, I knew I needed to know how to play it. And I did. The lyrics are sweet and the other instruments are pleasant, and it's just a great song to go before the final song of Good and Evil. The fact that this is the lowest ranked Hawaii Part 2 song goes to show how much of a masterpiece it really is. I'm not the biggest fan of Isle Unto Thyself, but that may be because I listened to it so much. I didn't listen to all of Hawaii Part 2 for a long time, far longer than I should have, but I did listen to this song in Introduction to the Snow. I thought that was fantastic and that it must be the best song from the album. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it may be a thing with me listening to it over and over again, but it also isn't too interesting. The melody is repetitive and I don't like the reverb female singing throughout the song, but in general it's pretty nice. This is the point where the songs become more than just good. If you said I could only listen to one song for the rest of my life, these would all be contenders. Dude, where's my car? This really stands out from the rest of Andrew's work. By all means, this isn't a bad thing, but it is interesting how this and Good Day are so separate from what the rest of his work sounds like. He has a succinct style in Good and Evil onwards that just doesn't sound like this. Anyway, Taken for a Ride is a great song, similar to the first five songs of Marvin's, then it goes downhill. The transition from Welcome to Tally Hall to this is fantastic, and while it does make listening to all of the former on its own awful at the end, it makes the latter far better if you listen to both. It sounds great musically, has good lyrics, everything about it is good, that's why it's right on the edge of A tier. Hey, this song has a music video- Oh my god, what the hell? The Rendezvous is a great song, and definitely one of Rob's better post-Tally Hall works. This song is a great duet between Rob and Maddie Diaz, who is also in Black Rainbows as the female voice. The back and forth between the two is excellent, and it's a great story within the song, but we won't talk about that story. This song is about a relationship between two people who have begun to drift apart romantically, but unlike many other relationships portrayed in music, they understand this and still wish the best for each other. It's a beautiful song by Andrew, and it is in my top three songs from Sketches. While his voice does strain on occasion, in general his voice sounds great in this song. The ba da 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 da's are super fun to listen to, and the humming portions are great, and the lyrics are sweet. Everything about this song just warms the heart, and that tends to be the case for most of Andrew's work. But all of my friends... I'm gonna win, which was once known as all of my f I'm Gonna Win, which was also known as All of My Friends, was written by Joe Hawley all the way back in 2004. It was actually going to be on Good and Evil, but had to be removed. Thankfully, Joe let Rob record it for Not a Trampoline, and th the fan favorite song finally had a proper recording. 
Maybe the reason I like it so much is because Joe wrote it, but Rob's vocals in this song are fantastic. The parallels between the lyrics and the chorus and then the post-chorus are brilliant, and it's just a fun song to listen to, and I'm very glad it got to see the light of day. Don't tell your mother. Two Rob songs in a row. I could not decide whether I liked this or I'm gonna win more for the longest time, but eventually I landed on this. Let Your Mother Know is a delight to listen to, and something about it really makes me love it. I think that this song is about parents trying to reach out to their child who has gone down the wrong path in life, and are trying to help them by saying that they don't need an invitation to come home. It's quite catchy, and the acoustic guitar sounds great in this song. I've been talking about Andrew and Rob for a while, so let's get back to Joe. And I already know people are going to yell at me for this next placement. Ruler of Everything is a great song. Nothing more, nothing less. I don't think that it should have been the song to revive Tally Hall, but meme culture does whatever it wants. Ruler of Everything has been around since 2003. Wait, that means it's nearly 20 years old. Wow. Well, anyway, ever since then, it's become extremely popular. Most new Tally Hall fans discovered their work through this song, and many memes created from it. Personally, I discovered Tally Hall in 2011 when I watched Happy Monster Band, and eventually rediscovered it in 2020 when my friend played me Welcome to Tally Hall. This song is all about how time is the ruler of everything and that we are helpless to its power. The lyrics in typical Joe fashion do talk about this idea, but quite vaguely. I think it's a pretty good song, but Joe has done much better work, and is definitely not the best song from Marvin's. You have, you have lots of talents. Uh, special talents, in fact. Special is a light-hearted single released by Joe after his solo album, which becomes heartbreaking when you look into its lyrics. Special is all about how Joe misses the time he spent with the Tally Hall gang. It's truly sad to hear. Like most Joe Hawley songs, the lyrics are vague, but you can clearly see the references to his time in Tally Hall. For example, I remember practicing most weekends at the expense of spending joyful time with friends, imagining that it would yield the best rewards. Aside from the meeting, this song is fantastic to listen to. It has a great rap breakdown in the middle, and the key change at the end is great. Hopefully Joe will make more singles like this. Is it Love of the Sun or Love of the Sun? Which one is it? Well, regardless of that, and is a fantastic song. It perfectly represents the theme of parallels within good and evil, and is also one of the many songs with and in the name. The lead up to the ending is fantastic, and the ending itself is a pretty interesting way to go. This is a delightfully strange song. It begins with chanting the colors of the rainbow in Hawaiian, interrupted with small lyrics in English. This song is all about the lovers featured in the story of Hawaii Part 2 meeting for the first time, and it's a quite strange song to represent it. And it's quite the strange song to represent this. White Ball feels like it should be the lovers meeting, but it's actually about the date they shared, and this song is about the events leading up to it. This, White Ball, and Island to Thyself are probably the most vague in terms of story development, but they're all good. As a dedicated fan of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure the video game, I was bewildered to hear the tune of the Medieval World soundtrack at the beginning of this song. Oh, and the Punch-Out song was pretty cool too, I guess. This song is probably the strangest from Joe Holly Joe Holly in that it is literally Joe rapping the names of, well, crazy food. Somehow though, it's an absolute banger. I never wanted to memorize a song as bad as this one. And, and I did. The music video for this song is probably one of the strangest too, featuring Joe lying on the side of the road wearing a trash bag and talking to a face drawn on his finger, and then him pushing a shopping cart through an empty parking lot. Seeing this really makes me concerned about Joe, but Joe does what Joe does. Also, the behind the scenes for this music video is some of the most recent Tally Hall related content released, with the most recent video being released in December 2022. Labyrinth is usually deemed the worst song out of Hawaii Part 2, but I think it's pretty darn good. It's extremely catchy, and it's a nice change of pace from the absolute acid trip that was the Mind Electric. And it's the only song completely sung by guest artists. Not counting Space Station Level 7, because Bora mostly counts as a main member of the Hawaii Part 2 crew. This song is all about the aftermath of the electroshock therapy which our main character goes through in The Mind Electric, and how he feels like he's lost in his own mind, thus the theme of being trapped in a labyrinth. I understand why people don't like this song all too much, because it's quite different from any of the previous songs we've heard, and it strays a little bit from the current story. While everything prior to this song has a more orchestral feel, this song is full of 8-bit aspects. 
This song is full of 8-bit aspects with crystal clear lyrics without any distortion, and this goes for all the songs after it too. While it's definitely different, it's still a great song. Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Rob Cantor, you've outdone yourself. The mere concept of a song about Shia LaBeouf being a ruthless cannibal haunting you through the woods is both terrifying and hysterical. And the fact that Rob not only made it, but created an entire live orchestral version completely merits the status it currently has online. With the live music video boasting over 80 million views as of December of 2022, it is easily the most well-known piece of Tally Hall related media. Rob stated that he got the inspiration for the song while he was helping a friend move with another friend, Andrew Lorich, and the latter of which began ominously whispering the name of the celebrity. Apparently, this was funny enough for Rob to make an entire song out of it. Along with another song entitled Christian Bale is at your party, Rob pitched a series of funny videos involving celebrities in strange situations to popular website at the time, Funny or Die, but this was rejected. After being posted online as a demo, however, it gained massive popularity, so Rob made an entire live music video with several choirs, a string quartet, and interpretive dancers. And at the very end, we panned to see one of the most famous internet memes to come out of Tally Hall. Shia LaBeouf standing up and clapping. Hey! Hey you! Yeah, you! That's right, there's not one but three songs from Sketches which are better than Shia LaBeouf. This one was quite close though. It was back and forth from being better to worse than Shia several times before landing here. In general, this song is great. It starts off with a fairly simple piano melody before launching into a full orchestral sounding tune. Andrew's vocals are on point here, with only a few points in the song which don't sound all too appealing, especially at the beginning. I think its placement in the album is perfect, because it's right after the weaker Miss Melody, but doesn't save all the best songs until the end of the album. The song is extremely catchy and keeps your attention for all four minutes of its runtime, which is the longest out of all the songs on Sketches. Mr. I love Sacred Beast. It's short, it's sweet, and it's super fun. The harpsichord and all the fantasy elements implemented into the song make it so unique within Good and Evil. It's one of the few Tally Hall songs sung by more than two members of the band, this one having vocals by Rob, Joe, and Zoobs. This was one of the many Good and Evil songs which was performed before the turn of the decade, this one being originally performed in October of 2008. It went through a lot of improvements before being officially released though. Every little aspect of the song is delightful and it doesn't have any sinister meaning whatsoever. TikTok has ruined this song. And by ruined, I mean made it unimaginably popular, garnering it tens of millions of listens on Spotify. However, this isn't about TikTok, it's about the song itself, not the slowed plus reverb version. This song is about three guys fighting it out to be chosen to be taken on a date through bidding. The three guys in question being Rob, Joe, and Zoobs. This song is one of the most catchiest from Marvin's, and brings a different tone to the album since it follows Welcome to Tally Hall and Taken for a Ride. The humming in the beginning is fantastic and inspired many other humming openings in new music. It was interesting to learn that the humming was originally supposed to preface Spring in a Storm instead of this song, which I'm glad they didn't do. Also, this song is the real vocal debut of Ross, with his contribution of being the auctioneer during the instrumental portion of the bridge. There is this girl. This is easily the shortest song on this list, aside from Joe Holly Attacks. It was meant to be two things. First, a reprise to and. This is apparent in the lyric, which are sung in the same rhythm as and, as well as the music resembling it, albeit much calmer than the intensity of the original. It was also supposed to act as a bridge between the first half of the album, ending in Him for a Scarecrow, and the back half, which begins with the trap. This separation is yet another way of representing the theme of parallels apparent throughout the album, and this is even more true when you realize that the exact halfway point of the album is when the lyrics to A Lady begin. People criticize this song for its length, some even going as far as saying as it doesn't need to be in the album, but some of these people are the same who will die on the hill saying that 13 is its own song, which it's not. Either way, A Lady is a beautifully short song with every little aspect of it being fantastic, from the heavenly hums in the beginning, to the short yet complex lyrics, and the beautiful arrangement of the instruments. Everything about this song is perfect. The reason it's this far down is because of its length, and while it definitely deserves to be in this album, its length does prevent it from being higher on this list. If it was a full song, a lady would definitely be far higher than it is now. Hi, Chris Hatfield here aboard the International Space Station. This was very nearly an S tier, but I decided against it. 
This song is beautiful, but I, I don't know, I just, I don't like the da -na -na -nas. They interrupt a beautiful moment and really tarnish the song for me. Other than that though, this song is great. I'm a huge Daft Punk fan, and when I heard that vocoder, I knew I was in for a good time. Another thing I didn't know until researching this song was that Bora sang this, and oh my god, does Bora have a beautiful voice? In terms of vocals, this is one of the best songs in Hawaii Part 2, and no, you know what, screw it, this is an S tier. S tier starts right- this is where the greatness of Tally Hall truly begins to shine. These next songs are all brilliant in their own right, and everyone should listen to them right now. Seriously, go do it now. Bicycle, bicycle, bicycle. I want to ride my bicycle. I very nearly put this in A tier, but it is a fantastic song by Rob. As previously mentioned, I'm not too fond of Rob's solo work, but this song and a few others I'll mention later are truly great. After the reasonable disappointment of Ghost, this follow-up song is a vast improvement. This song is pretty simple, as it talks about Rob's old bike, which he used for the majority of his life without replacing it. Ironically, this bike was stolen in 2013, and Rob hadn't replaced it as of the release of Not a Trampoline. Similarly to Hey You, this song starts out simply, but gains more and more instruments as it goes on. This is especially apparent in the chorus during the Hum Bitty Bitty section, which I might say sounds fantastic. The rest of the song is great as well, in which Rob perfectly portrays the wonder of going on a simple bike ride. I may have a small bias toward this song because of how much I love biking, but I think anyone can enjoy it regardless of their biking experience. So alone. You're not alone. Does that mean we can make out? This is a calming and mildly sad closing song to Not a Trampoline, which talks about a failing relationship and being lonely when you aren't technically alone. It's a beautiful song, and far simpler than the other songs off of this album, which is saying something, only having guitar parts and some minor backing vocals. Rob's voice in this song goes beautifully hand in hand with the simple and saddening lyrics. I love this song because it's so simple, but sad, and that theme goes throughout the entire song, and because it feels like a proper send-off to the listener while finishing this album. This fun song was originally written for a small side project with Andrew participated in during his time in the University of Michigan called Toy Orchestra. A music video for the original recording of the song is currently the earliest public video on Tally Hall's YouTube channel, being from over six years ago. This song was remastered and released both on Sketches and Sketches 3D years later, and it's one of Andrew's most popular works under the EDU moniker. It's about someone in a relationship with someone named Lemon, who is leaving him for a guy named Pear. There are several delightfully corny fruit puns in this song, such as ingrapesable and impeachable. On top of the meeting, this song is a super fun, upbeat jam throughout its entire runtime, aside from the bit before the chorus. Andrew's voice is pretty good in this song as well, although it is a little hard to understand some of what he's saying occasionally. And then you start thinking about what planes do, or rather, what they did. On September 11th, 2000. When I first heard this song, I thought that it was a really fun song with lots of callbacks to other Tally Hall related works. Then I found out that it was actually about people who chose to jump from the Twin Towers during the 9-11 tragedy. After learning this, I could understand the references to this seeing as one of the lines is literally, now jump to end it all. Meaning aside, this song is sort of a coda for Hawaii Part 2, as well as Joe's Tally Hall experience. It contains direct callbacks to Murders, Island to Thyself, and most jarringly, Ruler of Everything. This song also features Rob Cantor, both singing and writing the lyrics. Along with the inclusion of Rob Cantor, it's also the only song off of Miracle Musical to ever be performed live, having been featured in the heartbreaking Sonic Lunch of 2016. In general, this is a great song, and I'm glad it was made, even if it's not included in the album itself. Is this the real life? This is really the Bohemian Rhapsody of Joe Hawley Joe Hawley, and the name is a vague reference to this fact. This song is a long one, being nearly six minutes long, and it talks about the dangers of society. This description is quite broad, however, because this is easily one of the most difficult songs to understand the meaning of by Joe, and this is merely the one and this is merely one understanding of it. The lyrics in this song are seemingly nonsense, but one thing that connects them all is that they all seem to talk about the Bahamas, thus the name. The song is also sung quite fast in various parts, which also fits the theme. I don't exactly have a genuine reason for why this song is so high on the list, but something about it just makes me happy when listening to it, and I'll stand by its placement on this list. 
This is definitely the best song off of Sketches, and it's a great album closer. It opens with something much rarer than what we've grown to expect during the album, being the roar of a cheering audience. After this, Andrew begins singing an upbeat song about how there's nowhere else he'd rather be than with whoever he's speaking about, which could be about a lover or the listener. It's extremely different from the rest of the songs off of Sketches in that there's several instruments on top of the usual piano which we've come to expect from Andrew's solo work. The cheering audience really fits, because it truly does sound like a song which one would hear from a concert. It's super upbeat and fun to listen to, and the outro where Andrew lists everything we should love seems like the perfect ending to a song where the audience would sing along. On top of all of this, Andrew's voice sounds brilliant in this song. There's hardly a single point where it sounds whispery or hard to understand. This is probably the best of Andrew's voice in the entirety of the Tally Hall universe. Great job, Andrew. Hello? So, yo, you need a quest? This song has several aspects of what you'd find in Sacred Beast, and I'm all about that. This song follows the story of a wizard on a quest to well, find a quest, because can one truly be a wizard without a quest? This song is actually the reason I listened to Johali Johali, specifically because my friend wouldn't stop saying, what is a wizard without a quest? And I wanted to know where it came from. When I first heard it, I thought that Joe's voice sounded different, and that's because the wizard was actually voiced by Tally Hall supporter Alex Kessler, not Joe. It's not until the bridge where we finally hear Joe's voice, and Joe's semi-rap part where he finally gives Alex the quest he's been searching for might be my favorite part from all of Johali Johali. Eventually, we learn that this quest is actually for a Nintendo console, so Alex doesn't need to worry about those quests anymore, and I find that really funny. This song also contains a lot of references to other works, such as Winnie the Pooh and Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody, which will actually come up later in this album, as you already heard. There is also a reference to Ann Arbor, Michigan's radio show Treetown Sound, hosted by Matthew Altruda, devoted Tally Hall fan, creator of the Rally Hall movement, and owner of the Pink Tie. After being such a huge part of Tally Hall history, it's nice to finally see him included in an actual part of the Tally Hall universe's music. Every day I wake up and I hope you're dead! This is Rob's favorite song from Not a Trampoline, and it's also mine. The message itself is pretty simple, as well as being in the name. It's just a song where Rob laments that all he needs is you, you being most likely a love interest. However, that's the only simple part of the song. It begins with a pretty simple guitar backing track, which Rob sings over with his beautiful voice, and Rob's voice does sound brilliant in this song. However, once you reach the chorus of Rob saying that all he needs is you, it slows down so we simply hear Rob's voice on top of singular chords with a small echo. The song picks right back up with more instruments and a more vigorous tone in the lyrics, and then the chorus picks up again, and oh my god, it is one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. Rob's reverberating voice says you over and over again, while an increasingly intense orchestral background begins to build up until it all breaks into a triumphant reprise of the lyrics, with Rob nearly screaming at the end. And even after all the build-up, the song suddenly cuts to a calm tone, with Rob quietly saying, all I need is you, again, and again, until the song ends. This is a beautiful song, and easily one of the best sounding songs in terms of music alone. Spring in a Storm is a deeply meaningful song about how, in the grand scheme of things, we're truly insignificant. Although it does present the idea that us as human beings are as much a part of the cycle of life and death as everything else, and that we should have a smidge of satisfaction knowing that we aren't the only ones who will inevitably die. This song also pertains to the concept where one goes when they die suggesting that we return to whatever we were before we were born after death, which has quite the nihilistic view suggesting that there is no consciousness after death. While seemingly lighthearted on the surface, this song is extremely existential, and it's difficult to truly look into the lyrics without feeling so. The music in this song is equally as beautiful as the meaningful lyrics are, with a great ukulele solo in the beginning all the way to the intense closing of the song. The last part of this song is the most powerful to me, as it cuts from the conglomeration of sound to Joe simply saying, and never again, to a single chord on the ukulele. This line is even more powerful during the sonic lunch which Joe performed at, where you can see how truly he misses Tally Hall. Are you ready to rock? Are you ready to rock? SHUT UP! This is one of the earliest songs in Tally Hall history, with it only having been performed once in December of 2002 during the first official Tally Hall performance. 
As for when it was written, no one knows for sure, but we can assume that it was written for Listed Black, another band which some Tally Hall members were in. It's a real shame that Another Minute was never properly recorded, as it is an absolute banger of a song. The song opens with several layered repeating tracks which cut to guitar and the fantastic piano part played by Andrew. The lyrics and sound of the song resemble that of Greener, as well as having similar chords to Everlong by Foo Fighters. Unlike Greener, however, I love this song, specifically because of the piano part on top of everything else. The song just has a great rhythm. Even though Rob admits that he didn't sing the first verse correctly during this performance, his voice is great in this song. I genuinely hope that if Tally Hall ever does return, that they'll consider bringing back this song, because this song alone merits the entirety of admittedly incomplete demos existing. We need to talk about your ball. I never knew I needed Zubin duetting with Stephanie Koenig until this moment. Zubin's voice in this is beautiful, even though I did originally think that Joe was the one singing, and Stephanie's high notes are brilliant. This song is all about the date which our protagonist and their love interest share before she is murdered, and it is a beautiful representation of this. Unlike Black Rainbows, this song clearly shows the love that our two characters share, saying that them being together brings them such impossible bliss. This song is extremely orchestral, opening with violins and having several other instruments added as it continues. It's a great final positive note in the album before Murders hits. Good morning, everyone! Would you be so kind as to give me all your money? Unlike the rest of Joe Holly Joe Holly, Rotary Park is an extremely serious song. It's a grim recounting of the time where Joe and Zubin were attacked and mugged in a place called Rotary Park while recording the music video for Good Day. Ross spoke about this music video in an interview, saying that while recording the many segments for the music video, that they never exactly asked for permission to record in some areas, and that it was a get the take first and apologize later sort of recording style. This didn't work out in Joe's favor when he tried to film in Rotary Park, and this experience remained in his mind for quite some time. And that experience resulted in this song, and it has a wildly different tone than the rest of Joe Holly Joe Holly, which is usually quite silly. Another common aspect of the album is that every song is filled with samples of other works, such as Crazy Food sampling Punch Out, but this song contains next to no samples. It feels a lot more like a song Joe would write for Good and Evil, or Hawaii Part 2 even, with only a hint of the madness that is Joe Holly Joe Holly. In addition to the song being so dark, Zubin is featured vocally due to him being with Joe when the mugging occurred, and as I always say, any song with Zubin is instantly a better song. One more anecdote about this song, during the pledge drive Joe ran so that Joe Holly Joe Holly could get produced, one of the things that he sold in order to raise more money was the shirt and tie which he was mugged in. Apparently someone actually bought this, but no one knows who. This is an absolutely devastating album opener. Rob truly gave this song his all, and this is even more true seeing that this is the highest ranked Rob song on this list. Never Meant to Know instantly sets the tone of good and evil, and really lets you, ironically, know that this album will be nothing like Marvin's. While Marvin's is a fairly silly album with many changes in genre, good and evil really stays in one place tonally, only shifting for a few songs in the middle of the first half, such as Cannibal and Sacred Beast. And while the huge debate in the Tally Hall fandom is if Marvin's is better or they're both great, I personally believe that good and evil is a far better album, and Never Meant to Know accentuates this. From the moment that the guitar and Rob's vocals hit, you know you're in for a ride for this album. The rest of the song is a dark yet captivating tune about how while we wish that we could know everything about the world we live in, there are truly some things that are never meant to be known and should be left alone. The song is beautiful musically, from the build-up to the together agains as well as the synth and the chorus, but by far the greatest part of the song is the bridge, as Rob goes on and on about the world we live in and then the triumphant return to the chorus as the song closes. Every part of the song is fantastic, and I knew I was in for quite the ride as soon as I started listening to Good and Evil. When I initially listened to Good and Evil, I didn't find the song particularly interesting, although after listening to it several times more, I love this song, and man, is it an intense song. It's about a town which begins to rely on a higher power more than anything else, and instead of making their lives better like they assume it would, misery fell. 
This was one of Tally Hall's earliest written songs for Good and Evil, having been written by Andrew in 2006. This would also be performed in 2006 as a test which went astonishingly well, resulting in it having a spot in the Good and Evil tracklist. While the song is written by Andrew, it actually is sung by Zubin, with only backing vocals from the rest of the gang, and I don't even need to reenact the Zub rule this time around because Zubin's voice in this song is phenomenal. From the quiet beginning to the extravagant final chorus, Zubin's voice perfectly fits the tone of this song and the story it's telling. As well as the vocals sounding fantastic, the music arrangement for this is as well. From a single note melody in the beginning to the uproar of sound during the chorus, every part of this song is brilliant. Oh my god, it's snowing, look! Introduction to the Snow is a beautiful song. It opens with a simple piano melody which leads into a bloom of orchestral sound which fades into silence, leaving the listener with nothing but the sound of billowing wind. This opening alone cements it as the greatest album opener I've ever heard, but especially because of what it represents. This album is far different from anything else to come out of Joe Hawley's work, and this short piano melody tells this to the audience right out of the gate. Along with this, the reuse of this song's motif in Dream Sweet in C Major, the final song of Hawaii Part 2, perfectly bookends this album. After the brief silence, Joe's voice floods our ears with heavy distortion, although the distortion in the song simply sounds like he's using a bad microphone. According to Ross, this song's vocals were recorded using a telemarketer-esque headset and a freezing cold trailer. This wouldn't be the strangest place Joe has recorded vocals, as his part in Variations on the Cloud was recorded under a boat in a barn. True story. Regardless, these vocals have no instruments to back them. It's just Joe singing with some humming in the background and a little bit of piano at one point. Right after the lyrics end, however, we are thrown back into the cacophony of brilliant orchestral music, which perfectly transitions into Isle Unto Thyself. This song is a great example of what's to come and lets the listener know the true scope of Hawaii Part 2. Sherman inspired the greatest invention of my life, a time machine. Rob Cantor jump scare! I lied about Never Meant to Know being his best song, although this was co-written by Joe. Somehow, this song was deemed unworkable after being test performed in 2006, but am I glad as hell that they brought it back. Time Machine is the third part in the Electroshock Therapy trilogy in Hawaii Part 2, that's a weird sentence, and talks about how the protagonist wishes that he could return to the way things were so he could finally have some time alone from his thoughts. Rob uses a vocoder in this song, similar to the one used in Space Station Level 7, although there's no other tune. The lyrics in this song are fantastic, talking vaguely about our protagonist's regrets about pleading insanity during his trial, and how, if given the chance, he would try to make a better life instead of regretting his old one. After the second run of the chorus, we hear the sounds of a, a machine breaking down, and we can initially assume that this is his dream of a time machine going away after being locked away for so long. Then the chorus returns in a triumphant key change, which lets us know that our protagonist has escaped the facility where he was being held. This leads us to Stranded Lullaby, which involves him trying to sail out to the mainland but failing to do so. Stranded Lullaby is also a great song, but Time Machine is easily better. These final six songs in this list are the masterpieces in the Tally Hall universe. In my opinion, they are the greatest pieces of music ever produced from the five band members. Although technically six. This song is the most insane thing I've ever heard, and I've listened to Everywhere at the End of Time. This song is a fantastic representation of a man broken by the loss of his lover, going to the point of claiming insanity due to his grief. However, the judge believes this claim and sends him to electroshock therapy, which causes him to genuinely go insane. This song begins completely reversed, and when we reach the halfway point of the song, we discover that the reversed part of the song was the song itself. Similarly to A Lady, the exact halfway point of Hawaii Part 2 is when the forward lyrics begin to play. The remainder of the song is a listen into a broken mind. The fairly calm lyrics are interspersed with intense choruses, which overwhelm the listener. After all of this, there is an absolutely brilliant chorus with layers upon layers of vocals along with an actively shattering instrumental to back it, with whispers of broken text scattered throughout. This song also reprises several things which have happened in the album or will happen in the future of the album. For example, the synth used in Labyrinth appears throughout the song but is most prevalent in the bridge. One of the most heartbreaking moments of the song is when there's a brief moment of clarity betwixt the confusion of the song, where the piano melody from Murders plays, and while it's slightly distorted, it is mostly clear. 
This represents the person we follow in this album, remembering the one he lost, which led him down the path to the agony he's currently living in. This song also has one of the longest histories of any song in the Tally Hall universe, with it originally being written in 2002 under the name Inside the Mind of Simon. It was originally going to be in Marvin's and then Good and Evil, but was absent from both due to issues in recording and time. Regardless of it only being fully recorded a decade after its creation, The Mind Electric is a fantastic song, which deserves its placement at number 6, but it's not the best song off of Hawaii Part 2. Ha ha ha! In the beginning, I said I wouldn't cover most of Kojum Dip's music. Moon Waltz is a beautiful song which speaks about the relationship between the moon and the earth, as well as being a message about a failing relationship. Meaning aside, this song is beautifully composed and truly stands out from the rest of Kojum Dip's work, with the heavy use of classical instrumentation. I was actually introduced to this song because of my brief obsession over object shows, and this song was in a great animation for the show One. I listened to the full version and I was instantly hooked. I looked to see who it was by and I was shocked that it was Kojum Dip. And as I have mentioned many times before, I'm not a huge fan of the type of music Kojum Dip makes, but this song is an astonishing exception. Although I have begun to listen to songs like 134340 Pluto as well, and I like that too. My favorite version of the song though would have to be the piano version released by Bora in 2019. It has an astonishingly beautiful piano opening, and the rest of the song is mainly piano, with some minor backing instruments. Bora's voice is truly beautiful in this song, and it goes to show how Bora totally should have been a Tally Hall member. We'll go together in flight. Dream Suite in C Major is the ultimate culmination of everything previously provided by Hawaii Part 2, and it is astonishingly beautiful. Opening with a reprise of Introduction to the Snow, the song becomes its own with a string melody and Joe's beautiful singing of ever so vague lyrics. This with the combination of heavenly echoing awes interlaced between the verses, this song truly shows how it represents all of Hawaii Part 2 after the first verse when the French part from Space Station Level 7 makes a reappearance. As well as this, the motifs of Murders, Black Rainbow, Stranded Lullaby, and Variations on the Cloud appear throughout this song, although a majority of it is still original. This song is really all over the place. For example, near the end of the song we are told about how beautiful we are by someone entitled The Whale. While some may be less interested in the song when hearing how all over the place it is, when listening to it in its entirety one can understand how perfectly it all fits together. Every single segment of the song blends together perfectly, and it is a great way to send off our protagonist as he passes away in the Pacific Ocean. Bai, hi, sai, hawaii, we were never meant to part, sublime thy art. This song is a fantastic closer to Hawaii Part 2, although there is one more song from the album which I believe surpasses even this masterpiece. Murders is a heartbreaking song about the protagonist losing their lover. While White Ball is about a date the two share in the woods, Murders shares the second part of this story. Our protagonist loses the girl he loves and begins to search for them, this perfect person, a fountain of infinite mirrors. This portion of the song opens with an ear-shattering, distorted piano playing a singular note, which parallels the pleasant piano playing at the end of White Ball. Joe sounds panicked during this portion of the song, fearing that the protagonist may never see the one he loves ever again. The only part of this portion that is calm are the choruses, in which the protagonist thinks about his lover. And then we are again delved into the intense piano playing as soon as the search begins again. Thankfully, the protagonist does find his lover, but discovers that she has been murdered. This moment is portrayed in one of the most excruciatingly beautiful ways imaginable, when amidst the intense piano playing we cut to a perfectly clear, undistorted piano playing a wondrous melody akin to a waltz. After our protagonist sees this, he is instantly crushed, 
saying that everything he's done, moving to Hawaii in search of a new life, finding the woman of his dreams, going on a picturesque date in the woods, was for nothing at all, and now that she was dead and gone. This song is a pivotal moment in the story of Hawaii Part 2, and it is done to perfection. An interesting fact about this song is that it was pitched in 2008 to be in Good and Evil, but it wasn't added. I couldn't imagine the song being in Good and Evil, but the fact that it fits the story of Hawaii Part 2 perfectly makes me wonder if this was a central point in which the story was built off, along with the Mind Electric. Seeing as both of these songs have been around for quite some time. In general, this is a brilliant song. And like all great songs, it was ruined by TikTok. That's right, 2A. I couldn't decide between two songs being in this spot, so I decided to make second place a tie between two. This song means one of two things. The first being simply a song about a scarecrow from the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, as told by Joe during an interview. Or it could be about depression. Either way, Him for a Scarecrow is a beautiful song, being a nearly five minute long anthem. It begins with Joe singing over a simple guitar melody. Its lyrics speak about a scarecrow who stays in one place all their life. It says that birds believe at a distance that the scarecrow always keeps a grin on their face, and Joe asks if they will ever wonder that something might be wrong with the scarecrow. The instant the chorus hits, the listener is bombarded with sound, from drums to piano and the surrounding background vocals. The moment the chorus is over, however, we simply hear the guitar and beautiful whistling from Bora. While the meaning is arbitrary, I personally think that it's about depression. The song talks about the scarecrow and how everyone thinks that they're simply wearing a grin and are happy, and they never wonder anything else, when inside, the scarecrow wishes for more. Specifically, the scarecrow wishes to fly away and be like the crows that he frightens. This is shown in the bridge, which may be one of the most beautiful moments in Tally Hall's discography. There's a brilliant harmony, which leads into the scarecrow wishing to fly for nearly a minute. The musical build-up to the end of the bridge is constant, and when it all goes away, we return to a reprise of the original first few lyrics. The song ends with Joe asking if anyone ever wonders over and over again, while none other than Ross Featherman sings. That's right, Ross sings. He says the wind blows over and over again until the song fades out. While it's a small part, it's nice that Ross finally got a vocal part outside of Mucka Blucka. This is a beautiful song, and now let's see what it's tied with. Fate of the Stars is the final song from Good and Evil, and my god, is it a brilliant closer. It is a six-minute Bohemian Rhapsody-esque anthem, which has been around since 2008 under the name Mind Control originally, and that was the one time when it has ever been performed. It opens with a fantastic piano melody, which transitions into a four-part harmony between Rob, Joe, Zubin, and Andrew all singing together to some beautiful lyrics. I don't even need to know what the meaning of this song is. The harmonies and the music together may be the greatest piece of music I've ever heard. There is one thing which keeps this away from being on the top spot of this list, and it's Andrew's part. But after the bridge of ooze, after the second verse, the song transforms into something completely different which feels like it would come off of sketches. It's pretty good, but it completely breaks the rhythm we've come to know from the rest of the song. This is a brilliant song though, and it's the final song from any Tally Hall album. And if this is true, I'll be content. However, there is one song which I think is better. On swaying trees and mysteries defy.
words cannot describe how much I love The Trap. It was written and sung by Zubin, and it's all about the trap of the internet, which we've fallen into, and how people can watch nearly hour-long videos about bands which haven't been around for a decade. Wait. Anyway, The Trap does a strange thing where there's a guitar part, but only plays in the left side of your headphones. This is my only complaint about the song. Everything else is perfect. Zubin's vocals are on point and sound immaculate. Every instrument is beautiful, and they all drive together so perfectly. I really don't know what to say about The Trap. It's just so good. Listen to it yourself if you haven't already. And that's it. Thank you for watching this crazy video. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, keep listening to Tally Hall. Electricity.